Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. By the way, this is Melissa's twin. Or this is Math Melissa's Matthew's twin. Maybe is how it is. And he's got a good name. His name is Matthew Ryan. How do you like that, Taj? Matthew Ryan Richmond. He's a better quarterback than the guy in Atlanta, I'm afraid, because I don't think he drops uh, games that are up 28-3. to three. Oh. But... Uh, <laughs> You never lost like that, have you? No. Never, no. Okay. So, anyway, he's the real dude. Where'd Taj go? Hey, Taj. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. Do you know why I just picked on Ch Taj and Charlie? Why? That's what I do. <laughs> right? I love them. Yeah. But, you know what my, one of my New Year's resolutions is going to be, right? Pick on Andrew more. <laughs> Pick on him more. No, I'm going to try to be nice next year. Like it's like, you know, I, I was talking to Matt about this, and he said, I think he's just trying to be a, have a nice way of saying there's no way you could be nice. But uh, he's like, oh, don't you think it's like setting the bar a little high to, you know, try not to pick on people or, or whatever, not not be sarcastic and uh, all these things. And I, I, I'm going to try. That's all I can say. Try to be nice and see if that works better than what I've always done. Because look at this section that just vacated a second ago before I preached. So maybe things will be different. Maybe people will sit right there if I'm nice this next year. But anyway, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Actually, Charlie, Charlie needs a little bit of a hard time. He's a Marine, or he used to be a Marine, and that's what those guys need. He's not in here. I can't say used to be a Marine unless he's in here. He's, you know, once a Marine, always a Marine. But uh, he was a Marine, and Marines just need a little bit of toughness, tough times in their life, or they're just not happy. But now Taj, he's not a Marine, and so he's going to like this coming year, I think, quite a bit. Charlie might not like it. Mrs. Dolan's uh, Wednesday night, she said, no, don't be nice, Pastor. So, you know, I, I have my mean supporters. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, pull the audience and decide which way to go, you know, but... Uh, Anyway, let's just pull the audience. How many of y'all want me to be mean next year? Look at this. It's like a divided group. Maria's like, no, Pastor. Be I can be nice, can't I, Maria? Yeah, you can. Yes, I can. So she's she's rooting for me. And so here we are, Matthew chapter seven. And let's go to let's go to verse twenty-four. I'm really excited about trying to preach the message that I'm going to preach today. And I said trying to preach because we're taking on quite a lot here. And so I think we could get it done, but we're going to have to give it our best. Verse 24 of Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking, and he says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock." And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And then verse 28, 29, notice this. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Okay, so let's pray. Father, please help us this morning to be taught from the Scripture from one who had authority versus what is simply a man, man's teaching, man's opinions. And God, based on your authority, not only the authority of the Scripture, but the words of your Son, may we be able to live as the wise man who built his house upon the rock. We pray for your help in these matters and understanding for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, they're singing back there. You guys know the song, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock? Okay, let's sing it and let's, let's drown them out. Okay? This is our chance to get back at the junior church. This never happens. Okay, so I don't know the motions. I know it's The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. Larry, do you know it? Yeah. Come up here. Come up and help. Well, come lead this song. Okay, come up and do the motions for us. Run, Larry. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to sing The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. Whatever Larry does for motions, follow him because I'm just not cool and I don't know things like this. But I noticed yesterday, he taught the kids' church yesterday for Christmas VBS. Larry knows this stuff. So here we go. 
Okay, I forgot uh, to say, if if I forget what the motion is for the wise man, but the foolish man is kind of like this. So. Okay, so like this. <laughs> All right, go ahead. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splash. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. Blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. Build your house on the Lord. On the Lord, yeah. Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Different people have different endings. Good job, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah. How many of y'all feel silly right now? <laughs> okay, it's a little bit good sometimes, I think, to loosen up just a little bit. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for helping us sing the song. Whenever I read this passage of Scripture, of course, I don't know when I learned that song. It was before kindergarten. And I don't remember the last time I sang that song, but it was probably kindergarten as well. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that whenever I think of the words of that song, I do realize that that passage of Scripture is oftentimes actually divorced from its context. In other words, what we usually think of when we think of the context isn't what Jesus is actually saying. In other words, if we saying that the wise man built his house on the rock and, went, and it stood, the foolish man built his house on the sand and went splat, then we're told, build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the blessings will come out, down as the prayers go up. And now let me ask you a question. Is that pretty much true? Yeah. If you build your house on the foundation of Jesus Christ, uh, isn't, isn't it true that God will bless it? Mm -hmm. And uh, even without, uh, just, just without I mean, an answer to prayer or just because of an answer to our heart's attitude? Okay, so that's true. I'm not negating it. I'm not saying, that's not true. Don't sing the song anymore. No, we just sang the song. Okay, but it actually isn't the point of this passage of Scripture isn't the actual point of the passage of Scripture. One of the things I want to do when I preach is I want to find, I want to uh, figure out what's the point, what is, what is being said here, and I want to actually preach what's there, not what is true. I can preach things that are true, and I can preach them because I know they're true in other portions of the Scripture, but I'm not really preaching the Word of God if I preach something that isn't what the part of the Scripture we're looking at actually says. And so... Uh, the song is great. We can sing it in junior church. Maybe we'll sing it again here sometime. But the reality of it is, is that it isn't the point of what Jesus is saying. There are two phrases in our text. The first verse we read and the last verse we read, and they went something along these lines. When he had finished his sayings, or uh, in verse... Let's just look at it so I don't misquote it too terribly. In verse 24, uh, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine. And then in verse... Um, 28, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings. Okay, so Jesus, the Scripture says, promised the people that if they hear the sayings that He has said to them, and He promised the people uh, that uh, whoever uh, in verse 28, or I'm sorry, and the Scripture also says that in verse 28, He ended His sayings. So the question is, what sayings, right? What sayings? Do you remember when Jesus was ready to ascend into heaven after He had risen from the dead, been seen of the multitudes, 
for more than 40 days, teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he'd been seen of more than 500 witnesses uh, at once and so forth, proving that he was the resurrected Christ. Do you remember when he was about to ascend to heaven and he gave what we call the Great Commission when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then the next statement, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Okay, now we could create our own broader context and say that the things that Jesus commanded His disciples would be His sayings, couldn't we? I mean, that would not be inaccurate. But there's actually a, a, a portion of the Scripture that in context Jesus is talking about. It's what we've been preaching the last four or weeks or so. It is this message that Jesus gave, or this sermon, we call it, that Jesus gave to His disciples, which were really orientation, uh, it's an orientation for discipleship. In other words, He began in Matthew chapter 5, if you'll turn back there, uh, He began to give them some sayings, and His point or His conclusion, uh, uh, after He had given them a series of terse, uh, concepts or sayings. He said, if you hear them and you keep them or you do them, you'll be like a man that builds his house on the rock. So it begins in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 when the Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Do you see it here? This is where it begins. The sayings. So the sayings begin where? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2, and they end in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28. Do you see it? It's not even disputable, is it? There's no question, there's no argument what Jesus is talking about when He says, keep my sayings. It's what He started saying, the things He continued to say, and those things are what He said would make us as wise people. Now let me ask you a practical question uh, for your personal edification and help. And the question is this, how difficult would it be for any believer to thoroughly read, comprehend, and apply Matthew chapter 5 through 7? How hard would it be for anyone here, I mean, just be, this is not a trick question, you all look at me like, I don't want to answer. I think I know, but I want to answer because you're trying to trick me, Pastor, and it's not New Year's yet, so you're being mean. No. Uh, now, the question is, how difficult would it be for any person here to read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, a couple of pages in your Bible, thoroughly study them, comprehend them, and then live them? Now, I know that that last phrase, and then live them, certainly creates a, you know, it definitely makes, it, that's, that's the more difficult part of the statement, isn't it? Okay, but the question is, okay, let me just ask it a different way. I know you don't like my question. I can see it. People are like, I'm not answering that question. I don't like it. Okay, is it possible for every person here to read, comprehend, apply, or live these sayings? It is. And what will happen if any person here reads, understands, and lives these sayings according to Jesus? Blessings. God's blessing will be in their life. Do you know that there is an opportunity rivaling an offer that God makes in life? There's a lot of times, you know, we, we're looking for, are we we're looking for that break in life? Like, I'm looking for the break, the opportunity, the chance that's going to change my life, that's going to guarantee my success. And Jesus calls His disciples, sits them down, explains to them the things that are required of disciples, and then He tells them, if you keep these sayings of Mine, you'll be like a man that built his house on the rock. You're not going to be shaken. You're not going to be destroyed. You're guaranteed success. And actually, when I look at it from that perspective, vantage point. From that perspective, a couple of simple verses that make a great song 
become something much larger, much greater than that, actually, don't they? I mean, this is literally a place where there are promises from God Himself about success in our lives. And so I just want to go through the sayings really quickly and just kind of summarize the things we looked over the last few weeks. And I want to dare you, I want to challenge you to do what Jesus said and keep the sayings. Hear the sayings. In other words, it's a fantastic thing to actually know that you know the truth, isn't it? It's great to have confidence about something. But you know, knowing truth doesn't do very much that's practical until you act on it. A lot of people know things. A lot of people think they know things. And it turns out that what they knew was true, but they just didn't do anything about what they knew. You ever said, if I knew then what I know now? <clears throat> if I knew then what I know now? How many of you could actually think of something that if you knew then what you know now? Okay, let's just start here and say we know now what we could know then, and now is here already. This, one, this is one of those passages of Scriptures. This is a passage of promise. And we ought to start getting a little bit excited about that. Now, some of you all do excitement differently, right? Anybody hear the person, when you hear a joke, you go, mm, and you're really laughing hard inside. That's me sometimes. People are like, oh, Pastor, you didn't like my joke? I'm like, no, I'm just laughing my head off inside. It's really funny. You know, it's just, I always frown when things are funny. I'm like, oh, that's, that's funny. I like that. Mm, good one, bud. You know? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, you know, that's the way you're excited. But the truth of the matter is, is that for many of us, this promise that Jesus made ought to be one of those things that says, okay, I'm ready. This offers me hope. This gives me purpose. This gives me encouragement. And I'm going to practice what Jesus said. In other words, if Jesus promised it, and Jesus said, these would be the results if I do what He said, then, then I'm all in. So let's remind ourselves a couple of things about discipleship. You do understand that Jesus is speaking to His disciples here. When He comes down from the mountain, for me to prove that, I could read to you, you don't need to turn there, but just verse 1 of verse 8, when He was come down from the, multitude, great multi or from the mountain, great multitudes followed Him. Who was up in the mountain with Jesus? His disciples. Who was Jesus teaching? His disciples. I want to point out to you that there's a grand difference, is there not, between what Jesus wants from a disciple and what Jesus wants for a person in order to be born again. This is not a salvific passage of Scripture. It's not a passage of Scripture where Jesus is explaining how to be born again. And unfortunately, the Gospel is preached here a lot by people that, again, just pull sections of it and divorce it completely from its context. Its context is that Jesus is teaching His disciples how to be good disciples. We also said several weeks ago, didn't we, that it's possible to be a disciple and not a believer. It's possible to be a disciple and not a believer, isn't it? Okay, so who's our illustration? Judas. Judas. Who was the best disciple? Judas actually was. If you look at track record, you look at wisdom, and you look at trust earned, Judas was the guy among Jesus' 12 disciples. He was a disciple, but he wasn't a believer. And there's a big difference. And so I will remind you, friend, that what we're talking about here is useless for you if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. If you want to practice the things that Jesus says here, listen, they may benefit you insofar as that what Jesus says is actually true because God knows things. Just, just put it that way. You live your life the way God says you ought to live your life. Whether Jesus is your Savior or no, you'll benefit from the wisdom of living the way that God would have you to live. The Bible has some things to say about drinking alcohol. You know a lot of people, even Christians, don't agree with it. I just want to tell you something. Somebody agrees with what God says won't have problems with alcohol. And they'll benefit by it, won't they? There are things that God says are true that anybody who practices them can have the advantage in this life for. But my friend, the scripture, Jesus put it this way, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I was asking the teenagers yesterday what they were, not the teenagers, the kids, uh, when I was on the bus. I said, what are you worth? And I asked Starja. I said, Starja, what are you worth? She said, a hundred. I said, a hundred what? hundred dollars. 
I said, you're worth more than that. What are you worth, Sergeant? She said, a thousand. A thousand what? thousand dollars. I said, you're worth more than that. She said, a million? I said, you're worth more than a million. A trillion? You're worth more than a trillion. A zillion? And then they started making up the quadrillion and all the other, you know, whatever comes after. So, you know? The reality of it is that Jesus said that a man's soul is of infinite worth or infinite value, that if a person had everything that is in the world, that they would gladly offer that for their soul. That's how valuable your soul is. And we know that your soul has great worth and value to God because Jesus, my friend, died on the cross for you. In other words, Jesus gave his life for you. That's how much God values your soul. That's incredible. If you ever analyze and just meditate on the reality that God's perfect Son, who is God, died for sinful man who deserves death because God loves us and wants us to be able to be reconciled to Him, you realize in conclusion that God values you a lot. I haven't said it yet today, but God loves you very much. So much so that if you begin to comprehend how much He loves you, you'd realize He loves you more than that. You're of infinite worth, infinite value to God. And Jesus died on the cross so that you who could not do anything to make up for the sin that you've committed, so that you could find not just forgiveness, but that so that you could be reconciled to God because of His perfect Son. It's a substitution is what the Bible calls it. In other words, God takes the life of Jesus, who is His perfect Son, and sacrifices Him for our lives who were imperfect at and that's, that's stating it, putting it very mildly, so that when we receive Him, the Bible says, as many as receive Him, speaking of Jesus and the gift of eternal life, to them gave Him power to become the sons of God. When I was a child, I had this explained to me, and I accepted this truth and acted on it. And I just prayed to God directly. I just said, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to be saved. I want to be born again because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross for my sins. And God saved me. He gave me eternal life. Yeah. And I want to tell you something. Discipleship has a lot of value for me because of that. But if I were living for Jesus, if I were, quote, a preacher of the gospel, if I were a pastor, if I were doing whatever and keeping the things that are taught in Matthew 5 through 7, but I weren't born again, let me just tell you something. There's very little profit beyond this life. See, I'm looking for eternal profit. And that's what Jesus is speaking of. Well, we're finished with our introduction. Let's look at the things that Jesus said, shall we? Jesus began, first of all, by teaching His disciples. The Bible says He opened His mouth and began to teach and taught them, saying, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And here Jesus gives a string from verse 3 to 13, a string of supposed contradictions, certainly contradictions of the way that we think as humans. Jesus said, the poor are the blessed. We, as, we think, nah, uh, blessing means rich, therefore the poor are not blessed. Jesus is not saying that a person has to be uh, lack wealth in, a, in order to uh, have an inheritance or for the kingdom of heaven to be their inheritance, but the reality of it is, is that the poor uh, look for something that the rich do not, isn't it so? Mm -hmm. And, my friend, it's a wonderful thing to recognize your need. One of the things that I've realized, having been a believer and as I grow and mature, is that one of the great problems that we have and that limits us from receiving things from God is that oftentimes we do not see ourselves as needy. We don't even perceive ourselves as having a need. Matter of fact, most of us came today, most of us did not come to church today saying, I'm messed up and I need help and I hope I get it today. Had we, I believe we'd see God do some things for us. You know why you oftentimes don't get much? It's because you don't think you need anything. When it comes to material things, the fact is I don't need anything. But when it comes to spiritually, spiritual matters, my friend, let me just tell you something. I'm a needy individual. And when I realize that, I get things that I'd never get if I hadn't realized my need. The Bible goes on to say, uh, and, and we, we preach these, and so you could probably go on YouTube and watch the messages, and I don't have time to preach it again. The Bible says, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Verse 6, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Verse 9, 
Blessed are the peacemakers. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11, blessed are you, ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so Jesus said there's a blessing for people that think this way. And so the first thing we saw when Jesus began to teach His disciples is that disciples learn to think differently than the world thinks. <coughs> you could study that and you could practice it. The second thing that Jesus said, the second series of sayings begins in verse 13 when He begins saying, Ye are the salt of the earth. He goes on to say as well uh, in verse 13, 14, ye are the light of the world. My friend, if the people who have the truth, who know it's true, and who have had God work in their life are not salt and are not light, the world has no, the world has no, nothing. The world has no light. And Jesus emphasizes for the disciples the importance of being salt and light. I can't preach that message again. It's there, it's in context. You can find it on YouTube. But the reality of it is, is that it's important for us as disciples to be salt and light. Let me ask you a question. What's your flavor when you go to work? Let me ask you a question. How much light do you shed when you're with your neighbors? What's the effect or the influence of your life on those around you? A disciple affects and influences those that surround them. And we see the second or the third series of sayings in verse 17. And this is a, this is just a wrong way of thinking. Jesus told His disciples, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Most disciples and most of the people around Jesus thought the reason He came was not the reason He actually came. Most of them thought He's going to put away the law and the and the prophets, and He's going to establish a kingdom, and he is going to, He's going to deliver us from all of our problems, and this is why Jesus has come. And Jesus said, actually, I didn't come because there was any problem with the law and the prophets. The reason I came was there was a problem with the people who couldn't keep the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill the law. How did Jesus fulfill the law? Well, He lived a sinless life, and then He died for sin. The law condemns every person who's ever sinned, and that's every person who's ever lived with the exception of Jesus. And so Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law. You could study Galatians. You could study uh, the purpose of the law and being a schoolmaster that teaches us that we have need of a Savior. And Jesus, my friend, is the person you look to when you get schooled about the law. Okay? So that's a third of the sayings. Then we see... I'm sorry, the fourth of the sayings. Then we see, if you look down further... Uh, we're moving right along now, and we've got to because we are way out of time. And it's hot in here, isn't it? it warmed up. I'm going to turn the air conditioners on. I don't think they were turned on earlier, so I'll freeze you up now. We'll be in great shape. All right, I hope that's a help. <laughs> it's, it's really hot up here wearing this. You know, this, this suit kept Jimmy Stewart warm. You remember what happened to Jimmy Stewart? He was wearing this suit, and it's a wonderful life, and he jumped off the bridge. And he was wearing the suit, right? And uh, it's probably what kept him alive. But it's a little too warm for the climate here right now. So this is Jimmy Stewart's suit. You guys know this, right? That's why I'm wearing it during the holiday season. Pastor, where'd you get it? I was shopping at Marshall's, and I saw it. And I told my wife, I said, that's Jimmy Stewart's suit. And she said, yeah, it sure is. So I bought it. So if you want an autograph later from somebody wearing Jimmy Stewart's suit, come see me. I'll help you out. But it's warm up here. Let's get back in the Scripture. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. You can read the law and actually see the rules for dealing with murder. And you can see even ways that a person could not be put to death if he'd killed, but he'd killed and it was more like a manslaughter instead of murder. And so Jesus said, this is what the law says. Verse 22, He said, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. And then in verse 25 he said, Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time thy, the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Some years ago, uh, I tried to help a lot of guys that were uh, jailbirds. They, they'd uh, been in jail. They always talked about Broward County. And they, they would talk about that you, you, if you're going to get arrested, you don't want to get arrested in Broward County. It's not the right county to be arrested. 
because Broward County has this policy, the judges have this policy. If they offer you a deal, you take it. If you don't take the deal, then you get maximum sentence. That's the way it goes. And so the scripture, Jesus is saying, agree with thine adversary quickly. In other words, take the deal, because it'll be worse if you go to court. That's the kind of the idea uh, that he's illustrating. Obviously not with our illustration, but that's the notion of it. And Jesus here in this section of sayings is explaining to the disciples that he has a higher standard uh, than the law has. In other words, a disciple has a higher standard for living. Verse uh, 27, we see this illustrated again. You have heard it that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so Jesus said, you know, the saying back then was, don't do this. This is a defined act of adultery. And Jesus said, actually, adultery is in the heart. Adultery is unfaithfulness. And unfaithfulness is by degrees. And so if a person looks this way on someone, then that's adultery. Jesus has a higher standard. Uh, and uh, we see for uh, in verse 33, again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, uh, that, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Jesus said, you know, they said, this is the way that you make an oath or a promise or that you swear by something. And Jesus said, I'm telling you, don't swear, swear not at all. Verse 34, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by earth, for it's his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thine head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Jesus said you don't promise, you don't swear a promise. Now we're not talking about cursing here, we're talking about swearing about things that you promise in really almost the degree of sincerity being affected by what you swear by. In other words, if I were uh, to swear by the garbage on the floor, you probably wouldn't think much of my promise. If I were to swear by, you know, the, the, the church building, you'd think, well, it's more than the garbage on the floor, but it's not much. If I swore by my wife, uh, or my mother, you know. You know I swear on my mother's grave, you know, something like that. Uh, then, of course, that's supposedly of greater worth or value. And somebody say, I swear by, and they use God's name. And so they intend, you know, to say, I'm really, really, really serious about this. I really mean it. And Jesus said, don't do that at all. He said, let your communication be yes, yes, and no, no, yay, yay, no, no. In other words, he said, don't swear by anything, just always tell the truth. You know, if you always tell the truth, you'll get a reputation for always telling the truth. And when you give your word, people will say, well, I don't know if that's possible or not, but I believe them because of the reputation of the person that made the promise. Okay? So Jesus said, just, just keep your word. Verse 38, you've heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. He's talking about revenge. So they take your tooth, you take their tooth. They take your eye, you take their eye. And, but he goes on to say, if somebody wants something, anyone will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Give him whatever they want, give him more. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. That's the Roman soldiers had the right to make a Jewish citizen carry their pack for them a mile. They had a legal right. And they said, if they, if, if they make you carry their pack for a mile, carry it two. Do both. Carry it two miles. Okay, now, uh, in, in verse, so we see again a higher standard. Verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Verse 44, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good them, to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. My friend, that isn't how we think, is it? We think, okay, I, you know what, you're my friend. You know, we, we will have friendship benefits. But if you want to become my enemy, let me tell you something, you made an enemy that you'll regret having. The fact of the matter is, Jesus said, you know, if somebody's your enemy, uh, treat them like a friend. Bless people that curse you and do things for people that despitefully use you. And now you're starting to say, Pastor, I'm not so sure I want to sign up for this. I'm not so sure this is the path I want to take. What did Jesus promise to the people that hear His sayings and do them? It'd be like the man that built his house on the rock. Let me ask you a question. Who knows more about living? The person who is eternal or the person who has only lived a number of years and their days are numbered? You ever look at it in that perspective? How much does God know and how much do we know? God's eternal. We're temporal. That kind of makes it as though anything that God thinks is certainly more true, more correct, and better 
than what we think. Isn't it so? Yes, it is. Let's move on. All right. <laughs> Verse uh, 1 of chapter 6. Take heed that you do not your alms before men. Don't give to impress men. We see in verse 1. Uh, and then we see in verse 5, don't pray to impress men. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corner of the streets. I'm going to let you in on a little secret of something mean I did this morning because it's still the old year. Okay? Uh, somebody that I don't know on Facebook contacted me and they said, Praise the Lord. That's what they say. Here's what they say when they want money. People that I don't know that contact me on Facebook. They say, Praise the Lord, brother. And I know. I just say, Well, how much would you like? You know? <laughs> you know? So this morning a guy said, Praise the Lord. And I said, Why? Why are you praising the Lord? And he said, Well, because you should praise the Lord. I said, So should you. You praise Him. Don't talk to me about it. <laughs> Why are you telling me you're praising the Lord? If you're praising the Lord, doesn't He know? You don't need me for a witness. God, God can get it if you praise Him, right? Okay, take heed. Hey, that was mean, wasn't it? I didn't know it. I didn't want to give the guy any money. I'm cheap, and that was my easy out. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, I need to change. I'm, I'm a terrible person. Uh, in verse 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. What do people want that pray in public? I'm not talking about somebody that offers a public invocation. I'm talking about somebody, you know, they're letting you know they're praying. Everybody, please, be quiet. I'm going to pray. And they start, Dear God. Why are they doing that? What are they doing it for? Yeah, they want you to think that they're really spiritual. They've got a connection with God and they're praying because they want to impress you, not because they care about what God thinks. And that's why do people give publicly? Why do people have to give and have their name put on a building? Or why do they have to dance down front to put their money in the offering plate? Or why do they uh, have to let everybody... <laughs> my, no kidding. And now I won't tell stories. We don't have time. Anyway, uh, why do people do these things? Well, because they want to impress people. And my friend, if you're, you're, if you're concerned with impressing people, unfortunately, that will supplant a concern with having a God in heaven who knows your heart to know what you are and be impressed. God can be impressed by your heart, by the way. You can be impressive to God by pleasing Him and being what He wants you to be. And that's the way we ought to be. That's a saying of the Lord Jesus. And it's a wise one, and it's true. And then He gives it a model for prayer, how to, how to ask God for things. Notice this, we're almost done. Verse 19, uh, we're told about uh, value, things we value. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Be honest about what you value. You know, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure what I treasure. Well, just, just uh, sometime uh, evaluate your day. Sometime when somebody like your wife says, How was your day? Or what did you do today? Actually think about what you actually did. And you'll figure out what you treasure. You'll figure out what's important to you, what's valuable to you. Some people treasure lust. And they spend a good portion of their day lusting after things, desiring things which God does not want to be in their heart, does not want them to have, and that's where their treasure is. Some individuals treasure possessions, and they spend a lot of their time either admiring or uh, playing with or uh, trying to accumulate possessions. And that's where their heart is. Where you invest your time, my friend, is where your heart is. And where your heart is, the Bible says where your treasure is, there's your heart also. And so just look at yourself sometime. You know, that's what concerns me about people not having time to come to church. I'm not a judge of any person. We'll see a, a statement about that. But I just know what people treasure when they don't have time for spiritual things. I know what people treasure when they don't have time for spiritual things. Let's move on. Verse 9 uh, you have to be single-minded. No man can serve two masters. For you will hate the one and hold to the other, and love the other, or else you'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You have to make a choice of whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God, or are you going to serve the riches of this life or this world? Are you going to serve something other than God? Moving on, again, in verse uh, chapter 7, verse 1, Judge not, and we know that it's a statement of purpose, in order that ye be not judged. And so we see that if you're going to be the person who passes judgment on other individuals, then you will, as a result, 
come under the same kind of judgment that you judge. And the Scripture here does not say don't ever judge. But our, the reminder here is that God is the judge and uh, that when you're going to judge, you need to take into consideration what is wrong in your life. I found the most judgmental people oftentimes are the people with the most flaws and that being judgmental is the easiest way to overlook what's the problem here so that I can focus on the problem there because I don't want to be judged. The Bible says if you're going to be like that, you're going to be judged. Okay? Uh, and it means what it says. It's not, it's, it's not tongue in cheek. Uh, Jesus isn't speaking out of the side of his mouth. And we see value. Don't give things that are holy. Verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a, of a two-way statement in Proverbs where the Bible says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Then the next verse says, Answer a fool according to his folly, that he may be, what is it, that he may be uh, warned. That what? Yeah, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So the idea is, don't speak to a guy, don't respond to stupidity, with you know because stupidity can't really be responded to. I've said something like this a few times. If a person had a nugget of understanding, we'd have somewhere where we could begin a discussion. But they're so devoid of any kind of uh, they're so devoid of any kind of facts or truth or knowledge that we don't even have a premise to begin on to discuss on it something we disagree about. Uh, I think the context I say it most often about is when somebody tries to deny that Jesus ever lived. Jesus never existed. My friend, that's kind of silly when you think about it. And when somebody wants to debate the existence of Christ, whether or not Christ ever came into this earth, they don't want to debate that whether He was God or whether He did miracles. They just don't even believe He ever existed. We don't really have much to work with. It's kind of you know surreal to be meeting uh, named after the name of a person who never existed all around the world today, isn't it? Silly for a person. So you got to have a certain amount of of uh, something to relate to. Okay, I've got to rush. We've got to we've got to move on very very quickly. The next statement was that it was was where we were at last week. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Two weeks ago, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find in. We looked at oftentimes the majority is wrong. And that actually those individuals who are disciples of the Lord Jesus and who are believers in Jesus are not only going the uh, narrow path. People have a real problem with the narrow-mindedness of Jesus, don't they? Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And a lot of people have a problem with that. And they say, you know, why does it only have to be Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is the only perfect person, the only one who is able to take care of the sin problem that man has. And it's a mockery to think that God would have His precious Son die and it was unnecessary to do so. Jesus is the only way. Enter the straight gate. And we realize that the direction that people who are followers of Jesus are going is on the actual same path, but it's dead center going the opposite direction of the way everyone else is going. Literally, I'm headed to heaven. Everyone else is headed to destruction. Jesus said, take the narrow path. Take the, the straight gate. Straight is a word. It's an old English word that means narrow, and it's a really solid word to describe it. Then he talks about false prophets and the description of false prophets. They are ravening wolves. They, they come in sheep's clothing. They look innocent, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. I've seen this ever so occasionally in, in good churches. I've seen individuals that are actually wolves. They're there for their own gain, for their own purpose. They're there to plunder or take advantage of the sheep or of the flock. And they come and they look very innocent. Matter of fact, here's an observation. Notice it sometime and, and see, see it for yourself. I've noticed that the person who is the biggest troublemaker in the church looks the most innocent. And the person who's trying to stand against them looks evil. This person just, I don't know why pastor's so angry with me. I don't know why he's speaking to me in that tone of voice. Or why we won't let me do it? Well, because you're teaching false doctrine. You're destroying people's lives. You're a wolf. But a wolf tries to be clothed or cloaked as innocent or as a sheep. And uh, they, they're the opposite. The Bible says, that, how do you know them? Well, it says, by their fruit ye shall know them. So you can tell what a wolf is by what he does or what he produces. And if a guy produces false doctrine... False doctrine also uh, produces destruction in the lives of people. It's a wolf. And so it may look like a sheep, but it's not. It's kind of tough sometimes, isn't it? When somebody's really, really... The, the, the worst people are the nicest people. The person trying to hurt you or harm you always is the person who is trying to pose as the person who's your best friend. And that's the way a wolf is. 
And then Jesus, last week we looked at in verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We know what God's will is, don't we? Uh, the Bible says, God who will have all men to be saved and to come in the knowledge of the truth. And so no person because of saying, I've done things in your name. And we use for an illustration the woman who followed the Apostle Paul when he was preaching and said, these men are servants of the Most High God would show unto us the way of salvation. If that isn't Lord, Lord, I don't know what is. In other words, these are legitimate preachers of the Gospel and they'll show us salvation. But they were saying those things to distract people from actually listening to the prophets or to the, to the men of God. And so they were listening to the person talking about the person and actually that woman had a devil in her that was speaking. Now, I don't want to say that unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen, you can know the Christian buzzwords. You can pass through the waters of the baptismal tank, but if you've never been born again, you're just a person who says, Lord, Lord, but God says, depart from me, I never knew you. God only knows people because they are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the exclusive only way for eternal life. In verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And we began this morning by asking the question, how many of us could hear and do the things? Well, let's ask the practical question again because I didn't even get any yeses or nos really. I got some kind of like, a mm, little bit of that, but no, nothing solid. Let me ask you a question. How difficult would it be for a disciple to keep this really brief series of terse commands or sayings of Jesus? Well, on the scale of 1 to 10, you tell me, what's the difficulty level here? <laughs> Humanly speaking, 10. Mm -hmm. There are some things that you all said that's a deal breaker when we read. Like, I was going to do it until I read that one. And that's where really the conviction, the help of the Holy Spirit of God comes from. Because, my friend, I want to tell you the honest truth. The scale of difficulty isn't a 10, it's a 1. If you'll just do it in God's power. See, the fact of the matter, humanly speaking, to think like Jesus, to think like God thinks, to respond the way God would have us to respond, to be what God wants us to be, humanly speaking, is nigh impossible. We do see that a person could say, Lord, Lord, they could look like they're doing it, humanly speaking. So I'm not saying it is impossible, I said nearly impossible. But by the help of God's Spirit, my friend, every single one of these things is and can be not only possible, but a simple part of following Jesus. Let me ask another question related to the first. How many of these things did Jesus keep? All of them. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, do you think you might have a bit of a head start? Yeah. Do, actually. See... Oftentimes we think we have to operate within the boundaries of human strength and, and man's wisdom. And that's a sure recipe for failure in every instance. But, see, Jesus is not one of these individuals that's telling His disciples, here's what I want you to do now, go do it, see you later. First thing Jesus did was He led His disciples, He proved that He was God, and then He went to the cross and came back from the dead and then he promised if I go away I'll send you another comforter the word comforter <coughs> there is somebody who does what I do Jesus said I will never leave you I will never forsake you and I will remind you my friend that if you have Jesus as your Savior God's Spirit is Christ in us living in your heart and you're not alone let me ask you another question then keeping that in mind if Jesus were here standing beside you and you are faced with any of the decisions of how to respond, either man's way or God's way, how simple would it be if Jesus were standing beside you? Now that puts things in perspective, doesn't it? I am amazed sometimes when I'm riding with Christians in the vehicle and somebody does something and did the words that are said or the things that people do and then they say, oh, sorry, Pastor. Jesus is living in you if Jesus is your Savior. If you've been born again, if you've ever had a time when you've realized, I'm a sinner, I deserve hell, but Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died for sin, was buried, rose again, and said that if any, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the Word of God says. If you've received Jesus as your Savior, my friend, God's Spirit lives in you. He's Christ in you. Amen. 
And so the question is on a scale of difficulty of 1 through 10, how impossible is it to keep the sayings of Jesus? Well, much easier than if we were going to do it in human strength. Much simpler, isn't it so? So we need fellowship with Him. We need to walk in communion with Him, and we need to polish up our uh, understanding of what God wants. Sometimes I think it is not so much that we're in rebellion with God as we're just ignorant about what He wants in our lives, how He wants us to live. And we have here a roadmap for discipleship. You can be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, and you can please God with your life with His help. Let's pray. Father, thank You for what we've learned today. It's our prayer and our heart's desire that, God, You would help us to remember. Lord, I think sometimes of my failing memory and how often things go from my mind. And, I, and when I learn spiritual, biblical truth, I realize how much I need Your help to even be convinced or convicted about things that I must remember in order to please You. God, I pray for each person here today. Lord, I pray first of all for those individuals that may not know that they have eternal life, maybe in question or in doubt of it. Maybe they're religious, or maybe they're religious like Judas is. They, they're good people, but they don't have Christ in them. And God, I pray that you would, by your Spirit right now, show them that that's the great need. Discipleship's important, but it doesn't matter for a person who doesn't know Jesus for their Savior. They must be born again. God, I pray for each individual here today that would say, you know, I've been challenged by the standard of living that is in Christ's Word. And these sayings that Jesus made, I agree with God about these things. And I want to commit to God by His help to try and live these things. God, I do need Your help. Now, before we finish our prayer, before everyone opens their eyes, I would ask that out of respect for every person around you, that you would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We don't always do, but sometimes we do have an invitation in our service. And I'd like to have a time of invitation this morning, if you'll permit. The invitation is just a time when we invite you <laughs> to respond to what God has said. I want to ask a question in, the privacy, uh, in, in, in privacy this morning. My eyes are open. I'm looking around, and I can see that every person in here has their eyes closed. And so it would be something between you, God, and me if you were to answer the question. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, the matter of eternal life is one that I do not have certainty about. I do not know that if I were die, to die today that I would go to be with God. It may be possible that instead God would be my judge and I'd be eternally separated from Him. That's a matter of concern for me. Pastor, don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But I just want to raise my hand and ask you to pray for me. I'm not certain about the matter of eternal life. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up very quietly? Just slip it up and, and then just slip it right back down. Pray for me about the matter of eternal life. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. Okay? I want to ask another question, and this would be to a different group of individuals. This would be people who know Jesus as their Savior, but you recognize when you look at Jesus' sayings that, we, that you don't measure up to what His requirement for your living is. You hear this morning and you'd say, Pastor, God's convinced me that I can have victory, and I want to. I'm not saying today that I'm going to uh, be something that men would admire, but I want my life to be built on the rock and I'm willing. I'm willing to let God just have His way with me. And I want to keep these sayings. God's spoken to me. This is something that I'm going to. That is going to be a matter of surrender in my life. And I just. I want. I just. I want a witness. I would like you to pray for me because God is working on me about these things, and I'm going to respond to Him. We just slip your hand up if that's you. Okay. Lots of hands. Slip them right back down. That's you. God's spoken to me, and I want to respond. I want. I've seen some things in my life. Okay, so it's an important thing this morning, I think, for us to have just a moment of, of time. If, you've, if God's spoken to you about things, let me just tell you, God does not speak in general terms. He always speaks specifically. And I would, I would guess, I would venture uh, to think that if God spoke to you, it could be about something that's lacking in your life or something that God wants to be in your life, and you know exactly what it is. God didn't speak to you in vague terms. He told you exactly what He wants you to respond about. I want to have just a minute of silence and give every person here the opportunity to just tell God yes to what He spoke to you about. I'm just going to have a moment, and I'm going to allow folks to pray, and then we're going to conclude our service. Take just a minute and tell God yes.
Father, we thank you so much for moving and working in our midst today. We count it a grand privilege to have the Most High God, who is holy and set apart, who is in every way too good for us, to condescend to us, not only to give us our son, your Son for salvation, but God in this service today to meet with us and speak to our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Let me just conclude our service by just telling you what a joy it is to have the privilege of preaching God's Word. You're a receptive uh, church. I just There's no group of people I'd rather preach to than the folks here. And I, I know what a privilege it is to have the honor of preaching to you. And I just want to thank you. And if I can be a help to you in any way, if I could meet with you sometime during the week and open the Word of God and answer questions, if you'd like to call me, our, the number on the church bulletin goes directly to my cell phone, and I always answer it. Now, I may be on the phone when you call, but I'll call you back. And so I'm available, and uh, I want you to know that. I count it a privilege to minister and to serve you, and I'm here for you. And uh, so many folks in this church are as well. Please be back this evening to hear Brother Pierre preach. I'm telling you, it'll be worth your while, and we're going to have a great service of dedication this evening as well. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you. You're dismissed.